Pop, pop so grandly, and rock, rock so brashly. The top 10 was just great in early 88, and its king was the mighty Rick Astley. Good top 10 this week, full of legend and strange, so let's get into that week, ending January 10th, 1988. Number 10 was Moni Moni by Billy Idol, which got no higher than this, despite spending five consecutive weeks in the veritable caboose of the top 10. This was the number one in the US, knocking Tiffany's I Think We're Alone Now off the top spot, meaning a cover of a Tommy James and the Shondells song had succeeded another cover of a Tommy James and the Shondells song at the summit. Now that's pretty darn weird. At nine and fading out of the charts this week is a former seven-week number one, La Bamba by Los Lobos. This is one of five records on this week's top 10 that spent six months or more on the charts. It's a pleasant enough record, lively and all, which saw it dispatch Kylie Minogue's locomotion for number one and then fight an epic battle with, before succumbing to, Ice House's Electric Blue. They never did have another hit here, but their 2010 album Tin Can Trust is excellent and well worth checking out. Number eight this week is In Excess with Need You Tonight. In Excess only had one number one hit in Australia. They did have a handful of number twos and Need You Tonight tapped out at number three, although it did make number one in the US. I was at the East Coast Blues Festival a few weeks back and John Stevens, whom In Excess had hired as their vocalist in 2000 to replace the tragic loss of Michael Hutchins, was singing a mix of his hits with his band Noiseworks, which would fill a set by themselves, and the In Excess songs he sang with that great band. When he came to Need You Tonight, all of the volunteers in the tent temporarily down tools went outside of the tent and began dancing ecstatically. So I think it might not be too big a stretch to call it their most popular song. Need You Tonight spent three months in the top 10 and 22 weeks all up on the chart. Atlantic Records thought so little of the album this came from, Kick, that they offered the band a million dollars to go back to Australia and record another album. The band turned them down. It's number seven, and it wouldn't be 1988 if there wasn't something from Michael Jackson's Bad album on the chart. And in this case, it's The Way You Make Me Feel, a bouncy slice of Stevie Wonder-influenced Motown. While not the most dominant of Jacko's hits, haunting the lower reaches of the top ten and peaking for a solitary week at five, it's still as catchy as all get out and maybe just suffered from being in a marketplace with so much good competing product. At the risk of invoking the opprobrium of my daughter Ivy, of Michael's great quadrumvirate of albums from 1979 to 91, Bad was the least of them. Poor sequencing and a really dated production approach just pull it short of the glories of Off The Wall, Thriller, which on reflection might just be the worst sequenced album ever, and Dangerous. Michael's best music is utterly timeless, but bad is forever, 1987. Number six is The Ordinary and Mundane Hold Me Now by Johnny Logan. But this is completely redeemed by the fact that Johnny Logan is, along with Petula Clark, Engelbert Humperdinck and Boris Gardner, one of the most interesting people we've ever encountered here. Logan is technically an Australian, which instantly makes him fascinating, born in Frankston, Victoria, and returning with his folks to Ireland when he was three. He is the only man to win Eurovision twice. Hold Me Now was his second winner. He also wrote songs for another winner and one for a runner-up. Hold Me Now peaked at number 4 as part of its 11 week run in the top 10 and all up 25 weeks on the charts. It just goes to show that the purchasing power of the Australian granny, who seemed to be the target market for this song, remained undiminished in the late 1980s. At 5 is one of the best loved Australian rockers, raconteurs and rascals, Jimmy Barnes with unbelievably his only number one hit either as a solo or group artist. Too much ain't enough love. Considering that Barnes holds the record for the most number one albums on the Australian chart, 
15 and add to this the five he had with Cole Chisel, it beggars belief to think that he had just the one chart topper. He's hit the top 10 15 times, although curiously only one of those has earned a gold disc, and the only time he got as far as number two even was a duet with In Excess. Too much ain't enough love is a good radio time waster for sure, but not as good as the follow-up single, Driving Wheel, which itself went down at number 12. Barnes goes on today, still selling shed loads of albums to his devoted army of fans, still telling roguish stories of his days as a rabble-rousing rake, and still married after 44 years to the lovely Jane. I miss seeing him this year as his show was cancelled due to an operation he's had on his hip, but no doubt he'll be back soon enough misbehaving in a wheelchair if needs be. He's indestructible. Here's where we'd usually have our hello and goodbye section, but it is in effect an unchanged top 10 this week. So let's skip to the trade up where we look at the best records this week that never made the top 10. And two stand out for us, one from an artist who needs no introduction covering another artist who needs no introduction. I'm talking Joe Cocker's version of the Ray Charles classic Unchain My Heart, which was at number 19 this week, down from last week's high of number 16. 15 weeks saw it do duty on the charts. I like Ray Charles's version, and Australia will always like Joe, so much so that we arrested him. Twice, if memory serves. The best and most beloved record not to make the top 10 on this week's chart was Paul Kelly's To Her Door. Paul Kelly may be the doyen of living Australian songwriters. A man with a deft eye for character and motivation and a pen keen to sketch the tiny details that indicate them. His mastery of what some dim memory tells us is or should be the Australian voice can sometimes come off as a bit jingoistic, but in his heart he's really the Australian equivalent of Bruce Springsteen, albeit a less shouty, self-aggrandizing or idiotic Bruce Springsteen. Now, so let's see, 10, 9, 8, 6, 5, 4. 4. In the mid to late 80s, if any American arena act toured Australia and wanted a reliable opening act to get the crowd worked up, they hired Sydney band The Choir Boys. They had five top hits, but this is the only one anyone remembers, although the number 14 follow-up Boys Will Be Boys was pretty good. It peaked at number three and spent a mind-boggling 29 weeks on the charts. Only 10 other records we've encountered so far have spent as many or more weeks, and one of them is yet to come in the countdown. And it's highly likely anyone's ever been to an Australia Day barbecue or a major football code grand final knows this record. George Michael's Faith this week at number three is another member of the Sixth Month Club and incredibly only managed a solitary week at number one. This is part of the soundtrack of the Fin de Sequel, just an ubiquitous slice of popular culture. Michael had many more hits, but this was the best. His decline over the final years of his life leading to his death in 2016 was a sad and terrible tragedy, which capped perhaps the most sad and terrible year popular music ever knew. What's number two, I hear you ask? Why, it's wee Georgie Harrison, that guy who used to do that stuff in that band that used to be quite good. No one expected him to ever have another big hit, let alone a number one hit, nor release another album anywhere near as charming as the accompanying Cloud Nine. But it looks like we were the fools. Georgie's good-natured take on a song he first heard when he went to visit his sister in the US in 1963. Spent three months in the top ten, six weeks of that at number two. Enjoyable as this record may be, it is marked down a little because its success could possibly have been in some way responsible for the travelling Wilburys. Thomas Huxley, staunch supporter of what was then a controversial hot take called the theory of evolution, once said the world of facts lies outside and beyond the world of words. He also said that he'd rather have an ape for a grandfather than a bishop which showed perhaps he didn't know as much about how evolution works as he thought he did. But in the world of facts, there are facty type facts and fantastic facts, and here we favour the latter with Fowl's fantastic world of facts. It's Fowl's fantastic world of facts. The biggest mover this week is Tiffany's I Think We're Alone Now, up from 42 to 23. Tiffany was no Madonna, no Kylie, no Cher, no Adele but she was an exemplar of the curious phenomenon of the mall singer. 
a female singer, usually a minor, who, rather than playing concert venues, toured by setting up on rotundas and stages in the new large shopping malls, where they'd sing a few songs, sign photos, hawk merch, and usually have some tie-in promo with a record shop in the mall. Tiffany went on to two US number one hits, I think we're alone now, died at number 13 on our chart, and two top tens here. I think we're alone now made her the fourth youngest woman ever to have a US number one hit, behind 15-year-olds little Peggy March and Brenda Lee, and fellow 16-year-old Leslie Gore. Lord, who had a number one hit in 2013 with Royals, was 16 years old as well, but just a few days short of her 17th birthday when she reached the top. Three bonus fun facts. The shopping centre at Chermside in Brisbane, the Fowl Queen is a Chermside girl, was up to 2009 the largest shopping centre in the Southern Hemisphere. If we'd have had mall singers, they'd have been there aplenty. It's since been surpassed by the redeveloped Chadstone Centre in Melbourne. Two, Tiffany sued her parents to become an emancipated minor and lost. And three, many years later, Tiffany did a nude photo shoot in Playboy. It's that kind of assiduous research that makes this channel so rewarding. Meanwhile, as Tiffany shot for superstardom, hold your head up. A cover of the Argent Plotter by local supergroup The Party Boys was tumbling from 35 to 42. Highest debutante this week was Pump Up the Volume by Mars. It lasted 19 weeks for a top of number six, and it's the last we or anyone ever saw of them as it was their only single. And for the longest lasting record on the charts this week was The Locomotion, debut single for the female Aussie Engelbert Humperdinck, Kylie Minogue which was still ensconced at number 34 after 22 weeks and finally fell off the charts after 27. In the bastion of democracy, Whitney Houston held the number one with one of her seven straight number one hits. So emotional. For all her successes and obvious gifts, it is still hard to think of anyone whose talent went as unfulfilled as Whitney's. In the land of spotted dick, toad in the hole and stargazy pie, Belinda Carlisle topped the charts with Heaven is a Place on Earth. Carlisle was probably better value as a singer than her meagre returns of hits might indicate. In a rare violation of their no halfway decent number one singles rule, the British may have got it right this time. A whole year ago, Numero Uno was Pseudo Echo's amazing cover of Funky Town, a record much discussed in this series previously and a jolly good one it is too. A year on from now, oh dearie me, is another record much discussed here but in diametrically opposite regard, the reviled Kokomo by the Beach Boys. And the number one album in the town that was about to shed the first vestiges of its overgrown country town image was Jimmy Barnes' Freight Train Heart. Now, here's the ape I'd rather have as a grandfather than a bishop, but if an ape was a bishop he'd only play one time signature on the drums. Tutu. Get it? Bishop Tutu? It's Monty, the safety monkey! Number one this week is for the fourth of the six weeks on top, eventually succumbing to faith, never gonna give you up. The debut hit for Rick Astley. Six weeks on top, one of only four songs we've met so far to spend 20 weeks or more in the top 20 and a whopping 30 weeks on the charts. It's a quite an ironic cachet that defines it beyond the excellent pop record that it is. It's not what you'd call epoch defining in any way, like say John Farnham's You're the Voice was, but it's a treasure of its time and an ornament to the charts. And that chillum is how the cow ate the cabbage in the week ending January 10, 1988. And if the good lords will it and the creeks don't rise, we'll be back with another instalment next week. Ish. <laughs>